Hello and welcome to Duels of the Mind, where Donald Woods and I will be looking at another example of the best chess ever played. Donald is a world-famous author whose involvement in chess includes acting for a while as Vice President of the South African Chess Federation. Welcome, Donald. And I'll be asking you later to join me in analysing this week's game. It's our first look at the 20th century and takes us to Moscow in 1914, on the eve of the Great War, while on the other side of Europe, the Kaiser prepared for the unthinkable. Russia at this time was a bleak and forbidding place, but it was continuing the tradition of hosting major chess tournaments and supplying top-class players. The game I have chosen sees Ukrainian-born lawyer Osip Bernstein facing the greatest player that the Caribbean islands have ever produced, Jose Capablanca. Bernstein's career illustrates the disastrous effects that the two world wars had for many chess players. He lost his fortune during the 1917 Russian Revolution, and like so many exiles, settled in Paris. He was driven from his successful legal practice there in 1940, when the Germans took Paris. He fled to Spain, returning to France only after the war had finished, and he was still playing fine chess at international level well into his 70s. The main interest in Moscow in 1914, however, focused on the Cuban superstar Capablanca. He was born in Havana in 1888 and learnt chess at the age of four, amazingly with no formal tuition. Instead, he picked up the moves by watching his father play with friends. This was just about the time when the world championship match between Steinitz and Chigorin was being played in Capablanca's hometown, where chess was headline news. Capablanca's education was sponsored by a local industrialist, who paid for his protégé's schooling in America. In 1906, he went to Columbia University to study engineering, but spent most of his time at the famed Manhattan Chess Club, where he played frequently against Lasker, the then world champion. In 1908, his patron withdrew his support, and Capablanca was left to try and earn his living as a chess player. At first, his earnings were thin, but in the following year, he defeated Frank Marshall in a decisive match, winning eight games, losing one, and drawing 14. At Marshall's generous insistence, the young Cuban was invited to play in the tournament of San Sebastian in 1911. This was intended to be an elite grandmaster event. Two other participants, Nimzovich and, interestingly, Bernstein, protested that Capablanca should not be included. Honor demanded that Capablanca should destroy his antagonists and carry off first prize, both of which he did. Two years later, the Cuban government rewarded Capablanca with a position in the Foreign Office which afforded him ample opportunity for traveling and playing chess. He had no particular duties, but was to be an international ambassador, a famous and attractive figure, representing Cuba wherever he went. This even included a brief association with the early film industry as a star in his own right. In 1921, he crowned his chess career by winning the world title from Lasker in his hometown Havana, becoming the only man in the history of chess not to lose a single game in doing so. This triggered the myth of invincibility, which was to cling to him throughout his career. During the 1920s, however, his tournament record as world champion was neither very active nor overly imposing. In 1927, just 10 days before his 39th birthday, Capablanca conceded defeat in his world title match against Alekin. Capablanca never raised the price stakes necessary for a return match, although he continued to play in tournaments with mixed results. In 1936, he won a powerful tournament in Moscow, a point ahead of Mikhail Botvinnik. In the same year, he tied with Botvinnik for first place at the Category 14 Nottingham tournament, ahead of the then world champion Max Erver. His last first class games were played in the 1939 Olympiad in Buenos Aires where he played first board for Cuba. The outbreak of the Second World War, whilst the Olympiad was in progress, heralded a period of disruption for many of the world's leading players. Capablanca was not to play at top level again, and he died of a heart attack in the Manhattan Chess Club in 1942. Bernstein White, Capablanca Black, Moscow 1914, and Bernstein started with the increasingly popular move, D4, and Capablanca, a classical player, if ever there was one, occupied the center, not giving any ground. And White played the Queen's Gambit, 
which we also saw last week in the pillsbury Lasker game. And of course, a gambit is simply a move to throw the opponent off course in the opening. It's a sacrifice of a pawn, temporarily or permanently, to gain other advantages. But Capablanca, like Lasker before him, declined the gambit and supported his central pawn. Right. A gambit, you know, to people at our level, uh, we assume that grandmasters have analyzed these things so fully that there can be no hesitation whether you accept or decline a gambit. Uh, what, what, is this, what is the position? I mean, does there have to be any deliberation on this? Well, chess is a very rich game, Donald, and quite often you see a situation where a player offers the gambit in one game as white, and in the next game, he's forced to play on the black side of the same gambit. And quite often, these things are a matter of choice and taste. There's no Or mood, even. Or mood, yeah. even. Yes, exactly, yeah. mood. Um, See, may I think what, what, what non-chess players don't realize is the sheer infinity of the game. Because you can have... There are so many possibilities. I mean, it's astronomical. I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> I'm, I've recently been involved in a calculation to work out the space it would take to publish all possible chess you wrote moves. About that. Yes, right. yes. Of 25 moves. Now, 25 moves isn't a particularly long chess game. It's actually a miniature. 25 moves or less is a miniature. And I calculated with a, a maths professor friend of mine, Nathan Davinsky, that if you published all moves of all possible 25 move games in books the size of telephone directories, you'd have to cover the surface of the earth and fill all possible space in all known directions to the furthest known galaxy, many times over, before you could do it. So that gives an example of how well, the, the sheer infinity, infinity of it. Yeah. Sheer infinity. Yeah. So if a gambit, a gambit may be accepted or declined according to mood or according Absolutely. to... Absolutely. Yes. And yeah. we'll, we won't see it, but in 1927, the match I mentioned that Capablanca lost his title to Alekin, of the 34 games played, almost all of them were Queen's Gambits. Oh, yeah. And they were playing the Queen's Gambit back and forth like tennis players, you know, offering the Gambit back and forth. So you can never sit at an international board and know that if you play against Hans Rie of Holland and offer him the Queen's Gambit, he's going to decline or accept. You just don't know. He may even avoid it and play the King's Indian. Right. Right. So in this game, Bernstein continued developing his knight. I don't think it's the best move, actually. I think it's better to bring the other knight out to C3. I think this release some of Black's problems. And out comes the other knight. And you'll see we have the same position that Lasker and Pillsbury had last week. And Lasker chose this move. But in this case, Capablanca played rather more modestly. He played bishop e7. But I do feel somehow that the early committing of the white knight to the f3 square takes away a lot of possibilities for white. Sometimes you want to put this knight on the... As a general rule or in this particular... In this particular opening, yeah. I think the Queen's Gambit, the knight doesn't always belong on F3. Right. Many games by Kasparov, you see a trade-off in the center, and then later the knight comes to E2. And um, I think the way Bernstein's played it, he now played Bishop G5, it somehow reduces Black's problems a bit. And Capablanca Castle. No more of these games where people get slaughtered in their beds before their pieces come out. And Bernstein played a solid, sensible move. And Capablanca developed his knight. And the white rook came here. Now, Donald, every game that I've chosen in this series, I try to find games that somehow advance the theory of chess. And increase the level of sophistication each time. And what we've seen so far in this series, five games, every single one was decided by a direct, brutal attack on the opponent's king. Maybe under fire, as in the pillsbury Lasky game, but always the king is the object. And what we see this week is a dawning of a new understanding of chess, that the game can be decided not just by a brutal attack against the opponent's king. An indirect attack. It can be an yeah, indirect attack. Yeah. Obviously, the king is the final object yeah. of the game. Unless you can checkmate the opponent's king, you can't win. The game will be drawn. But by putting pressure on the c-file, by playing on the queen's side, and this move, rook c1, is the inauguration of that, by playing on the queen's side, we see that both players here 
are going to decide the game, essentially, by a battle. Away from the kings. Yeah. Let me away from Knock the out his u boats first. <laughs> That's right. They're playing for small squares, yeah. for tiny, imperceptible advantages, for very modest pluses. And coming to the king, getting the grips of the opposing king, comes at the end of the game, not the beginning. And this is a dawning of a new comprehension, a new subtlety, the awareness that even an extra square in the right hands can be decisive. The pawn structure can be decisive. It doesn't have to be aiming all the weapons at the other guy's king and trying to blow him off the board. So Kappa, as he's generally known, played this. Another Fianchetto, or Fianchetto, development of the bishop as it's known. And that is move number... We're up to move number seven now. Seven. seven. And white traded pawns in the middle. And black had to trade back. And now we've come to move eight. Now, has black liberated his position? Is, he, is black freed, freed himself? Being... No, he hasn't, not yet. Um, White's trade in the centre was actually quite clever because Capablanca was trying to put his bishop on b7 and then perhaps trade off in the centre himself and give a clear path to the bishop on the a8 to h1 diagonal. And what Bernstein's done, quite rightly, is to fix the central pawns so that when the black bishop comes to this square, for the moment at least, it's still hemmed in by the pawn on d5. So there's still no liberation yet. And in fact, the white position is probably slightly better. Now, if I were white here, I would play this, bringing out the bishop. Then I have to ask you why. <laughs> well, partly it's a good developing move, and partly it's aiming at the black king on the b1 to h7 diagonal, and it's also keeping an influence on the, on the queen side. I'm speaking it's... strictly as a knee-jerk club man. Mm. Um, I'll put the bishop back where it was. Maybe. Yes. He's waiting for the bishop to come up, isn't he? Yes. A3 is also not a bad move in this position. I mean, the move you suggested A3 is quite good because it's preparing to come here, which is in line with White's strategy of putting pressure on the C file. That's a, that's a good move as well. What Bernstein did, I'll put the pawns up, this is the position in the game, was he played the queen here. And I feel that this strategy is misguided. I know what he's trying to do, but I don't like it. Kappa played that. And you'll see the bishop is still restricted. And now Bernstein played this. And I think this is, in principle, a wrong decision. I know what he's up to. He's trying to gain control of the c6 square and the a6 square, which are potential holes. You see how subtle this game is? They're playing for squares and holes and outposts, not for direct attack. But I think that by offering to exchange the black bishop, which is hemmed in by the pawn on d5, he's really restricting his opportunities quite a lot. And Kappa, quite happily, traded that off. Bernstein, recaptured with the queen, probably thinking that he'd achieved quite a lot from the opening and that the black queen side pawns would be under siege from the queen, the knight on c3, and the rook on c1. What's more, I would have gone along with him on that. <laughs> mm. But now, move number 11, c5. And this is the position where I feel that Capablanca has, in fact, broken out, broken out yeah. liberated his position, and he has complete equality. He doesn't need to worry about the further course of the game. That white strategy has not really succeeded. If black couldn't play this move, so let's put the pawn back. If black was somehow prevented from doing that, then white had time to play the idea you suggested of a3 and b4, getting a complete grip on the c5 square. Black would be in a bad way. but in one, let's put the pawns back, this is the game position, in one fell swoop, as it were, Kappa plays this, and he has freedom to breathe. Yes. His pieces are cooperating nicely. And now Bernstein finds an interesting plan. He decides that the weaknesses in the black position are going to be the pawns on d5 and c5, the moment they're well supported. But he starts a deliberate policy, first by taking this knife, of undermining and eliminating the pieces which support those pawns. First goes the knight, and he takes here. Black could take with the bishop, but then the pawn on d5 yes. is isolated. Kappa takes back. And we have now what's called hanging pawns. The pawns on c5 and d5 are called hanging because they've got no support, and they can become weak. They can be bombarded attacked, subjected to siege, but also they can advance. Yes. And one of the great debates yes. of modern chess is the hanging pawn strong or weak. 
so many situations where they can occur, no one's really sure. We're weak with potential strength. Yes. Exactly. Bernstein castled. And Kappa played queen to b6. And if white takes the queen off, then of course he brings the, the pawn in to support the pawn on yeah. c5. Exchanging queens with white here would be a, a very, very bad idea indeed. So to maintain his strategy, he plays the queen back to the e2 square. And his plan now, of course, is just to put a rook here, perhaps even to put a rook here and then here, and pile up everything on that weak black pawn on d5. So black has to do something before this occurs. And Kappa now takes a pretty radical decision, one that I think even today many grandmasters will be reluctant to take. He plays this. And now he's got compensation. The open b-file gives him pressure against the white queen side. But there is, as we shall see, white played this, an excellent square for the white knight on d4. And this knight is very hard to shift. It controls the center, occupies this key square. It may later... Ray, this is why I don't attack. understand that black pawn move. Yes, it's, it's a courageous decision. And what Kappa played now on move 17 is, is bishop b4. And he's calculated the dynamic niceties very well indeed. He's, he's seen that he has weaknesses, but he also appreciates there are weaknesses in the white position too, that the b-file isn't secure. The knight on c3, which is attacking the pawn on d5, Kappa's preparing to slice that off and reduce the deficit. And Bernstein recognizes that he can't proceed without attacking this thorn in his flesh, the pawn on c4. He attacks it. And Kappa brings out his last piece, he defends. And as I said, you see this new subtlety in the game. The whole battle is taking place around these weak pawns yes. on the queen side. It's not a question of bashing the, the other guy's king. Bystanders, yeah. That's right. Bernstein takes off. And black has to take back with the pawn. And now black's got a passed pawn on c4. That means a pawn where there's no opposing pawn that can prevent it from advancing the queen. On the other hand, it's heavily blockaded, and it could be a great source of weakness. And this is where fine judgment and fine tuning, which Capablanca possessed in abundance, is so crucial. And white starts the process of besieging the pawn on c4. He's going to double the rooks like this, is his idea. And eventually he's going to move the knight and take the pawn. And Capablanca doesn't sit idly by. He takes it off. Bishop takes knight. And already now he's conceiving a brilliant defense to the weakness of this pawn. White takes back. And now a very good move, knight d5. And it might look as if white could take this pawn. Yes. But he can't because the knight hops in here, supported by the rook on c8, uh, and he wins rook for knight. Wins rook for knight. He wins yes. the exchange, yes. as we say. Yes. So the first white assault has been rebuffed. He has to bring the rook back, rook to c2. But of course, the pawn on c4 is still a very long range weakness. Kepa defends it by pushing it on. Now, the further the pawn gets into the white camp, the more of a danger it represents to white. On the other hand, the further it goes away from black's own lines of communication, the greater the weakness. And Bernstein played this. And now he's got all his artillery lined up, waiting to attack that pawn. And all he has to do is chase away the black knight from d5, and the pawn will fall. So Kappa has to find a way of saving it. And what he does, he could move the queen, but a, a five. he could play queen a5, it's possible, but it's exposed to attack by knight b3. What he does is this, rook to c5. And his intention, if not disturbed, is to put the other rook here yeah. with fantastic support for the pawn. So white has to do something about this. And he plays knight b3. Attacking the rook. The rook goes back to c6. White plays knight d4. Now, Kappa could have played for a draw now, 
by putting the rook back on c5. But he doesn't. Back. What he does is he goes back to c7, setting a diabolical trap. And Bernstein grabs at the bow. He comes here, attacking the rook and the pawn. And the rook goes, move 26 to c5. Now, what do you think about this, Donald? Well, it reminds me of the old movie director said, I can't see the movie. Mm -hmm. Why, what's he falling for here? <laughs> well, he can take the pawn. Yes. He has two rooks, knight, and queen on that pawn. Well, that looks pretty good to me. Yeah. And he thought, why not take it? Yeah. But he, he's falling victim to a combination that Capablanca had devised six moves beforehand, a really colossal feat of the mind. Bernstein takes it off. Why not? Capablanca takes it back. He trades. Black trades. Ah, yes. yes and he takes. Yes. Magnificent, sir. Yes. And now, yes. white's a pawn up. It looks as if black can play queen here, yes. check. Yes. Queen here. Yes. Rook d1. Right. Winning the queen. Yes. But he can't. He can't because of uh, the mates. Yes. yes. Checkmate. Black right. is checkmated. Right. That's what Bernstein must have seen. Yes. That's what he thought. And he thought, you know, I've got, I've got an extra pawn, I've got a defense against this, there's no problem. Now what Capablanca now does is an absolute thunderbolt. He plays first this. Yes. Bang. Yes. Deadly intermezzo. Yeah, absolutely. And suddenly, why had to resign? There's nothing he can do. He's losing a whole rook in this position, but it's this brilliant coup yes. that was seen so far back and if white takes the queen, for example. That's just frightening, yeah. Rook d1 yeah. is immediately checkmate. Oh my gosh, yes. That is extraordinary. And <clears throat> if he plays this move, which looks like a defense, he gives this check yeah. first. The queen has to go away. And then queen takes That's rook. That's right, yes. And it's finished. Yeah. Oh. And that moved queen b2. I want to put it back on the board again. That's breathtaking. It's yeah, breathtaking. Yeah, it is. Absolutely yeah. breathtaking. This thunderbolt oh, yes. game. Yeah. So, a wonderful game. Well, no the wonder you, you put this among the... Uh, in fact, that's... I can't think of anything better that we've seen so far, can you? <laughs> it's spectacular, isn't it? Yes. So this was played in 1914. And chess, for the next few years, really didn't take off. Well, the lights went out of the game for a long time. That's right. And sponsoring chess during the Great War was, of course, the last thing on people's mind. There were virtually no chess tournaments at all. In Europe, very small ones, but nothing important. And that's one reason why Capablanca, I think, had such dominance in the early 1920s. He was in America. He was safe. He wasn't affected by the war at all. Whereas in Europe, several, some, some grandmas like Schlechter, for example, died of starvation in the blockade. Well, thanks, Donald. Thank you, eh? But chess, of course, does survive. And indeed, it's absolutely crucial that the theory actually develops. We'll see another example of inventive play when we join you again for our next game in the series. That takes us to Hastings in 1922, when two Russians are center stage, Yefim Bogolyubov and Alexander Alekin. Join Donald and me for that. From us all here, goodbye for now. <laughs> <laughs>